Welcome to Writing Westward. I'm your host, Brendan Rensink. As we round out three years of monthly episodes, I've chosen an author in a book that is both intimate and personal. It's a book that can encourage all of us to think critically about what Western outdoor spaces mean to us personally, what roles they have played in forming our individual identities, both past and present, and how we might relate to them in the future. Today we speak with writer Andrea Ross about her book, Unnatural Selection, a memoir of adoption and wilderness. Enjoy. For new listeners, let me take a quick moment to explain a bit about the podcast. Each episode features a conversation with authors, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, academics, or others who write about the North American West. Our goal is not only showcase their work, but to spark curiosity among you, the listeners, to think more deeply about the region, its lands and environments, and the histories and experiences of the people who call it home. If a writer intrigues you, you can find links to their work in the show notes or at writingwestward.org. And if you have a moment, please do subscribe, share links with friends, leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using to listen. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and send in some feedback. Writing Westward is supported by the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University, where I, Brendan Rensink, serve as Associate Director and an Associate Professor of History. For better or worse, this is a one-man operation, with me playing the roles of host, producer, sound engineer, and just about everything else, all of which entail tasks for which I have very little training. But I am passionate about the North American West, and all the work is well worth the excuse to read more and to talk to interesting people. At the end of this episode, I will include some more information on me and my scholarship and on the Red Center, our programming and projects and funding opportunities that you could apply for. That's right, we may want to give you money. With all this business out of the way, let's move on to today's conversation. First, I'd like to introduce to you who it is we're talking to and why. Andrea Ross is a writer who currently teaches in the University Writing Program at the University of California, Davis. Her writing has appeared in various popular outlets and has been supported by fellowships and awards from the California Arts Council, Mesa Refuge, and other organizations. In earlier years, she worked as a National Park Service ranger and a wilderness guide. In 2021, Cabin Carey Press published her book, Unnatural Selection, a memoir of adoption and wilderness, which we're speaking about today. In this memoir, Ross relates formative experiences in the outdoors and wilderness of the American West she had growing up. With the perspective of hindsight, she now weaves these together with the concurrent life events she had as an adoptee searching for her biological family. She sees how outdoor Western spaces provided her with a sense of belonging, identity, and even family as she searched for her biological roots. It is an intimate and vulnerable exhibition that invites all of us to pause and reevaluate our own relationships with the outdoors and explore what unexpected roles it has played in our own life journeys. Andrea Ross, welcome to Riding Westward. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. Um, I didn't mention this before, but this podcast has gone monthly for the last three years. This is the three year anniversary uh, episode, I guess. And, I have actually, I don't think I've told listeners this yet either, but I'm actually going to now pause the podcast for the remainder of the year because I'm going on sabbatical and I'll start it back up next January. So you're kind of the, the ultimate last episode of the first three year run. Wow. Well, happy anniversary <laughs> and happy sabbatical. And I'm really glad that I could uh, slide in under the, under the curtain before you uh, close down for a little bit. Yeah, I have piles and piles of books that presses have sent me or authors have sent me to consider, and it's really hard to choose. And I'm not exactly sure why I ended on yours saying, oh, let's do this one as the last one. But as I worked through it, I'm glad I did. It's a really, it's a different book than most of what we've done on the podcast. It's very intimate. And um, I don't know, I I think it's just a it'll be a good one to end on for, for the season. Well, I'm really, really happy that you selected it. Um, I, I know that it's a little different than some of the stuff, than a lot of the things that you air, because I listened to your podcast, which is why I thought to ask you. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I really enjoy the podcast a lot. And I thought, well, it might be a little bit of a long shot, but I sort of feel like it fits. So maybe he'll, he will too. 
Well, it definitely does. Uh, most of your writing has dealt in this book and previous uh, things you've written uh, deals mostly with the outdoors, wilderness, the environment. Um, of the many kinds of writing that you could do, uh, why did you kind of settle in on, I don't know if we call it nature writing, but why have you kind of settled in on this genre? Um, I guess because in my life, that's where I feel the most uh, at home and also kind of the most inspired. Like that's where my writing brain kind of turns on um, when I'm out backpacking or hiking or camping or, or whatever. Um, like that ideas come to me there. So there's something about the outdoors and the wilderness in particular that um, that is just very uh, generative for me. That's what gets you the creative juices going and gets you thinking, gets you ideas. Yeah, I mean, perhaps you experience this too in the sense that, you know, we have busy academic lives and that's a whole different kind of thinking. Um, but when you're out walking in nature, you, you know, often have your thoughts to yourself and that's, that's when creative things kind of come to me, so. At what age did you start kind of putting pen to paper uh, in response to things that you had experienced or felt out in nature? Well, I mean, <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is, you, you know, there's every school kid was made to go sit and try to write haiku at some point. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps maybe you remember this doing this too um so I remember they that we actually went outside and sat by a creek and you know we're told about the 575 and the nature thing and you know told to just go to town and write haiku um I, I think it's very hard to write a good haiku I, I don't usually try to write them now but when I was eight it, it must have made some kind of an impression on me because I still remember that like that it was this moment of sitting and noticing. Um, and that definitely carried through for me. So I, I feel like uh, it's really been a touchstone for me for a long, long time. I remember when I was maybe 13 or 14, I was at a scout camp and we had to do this merit badge. I can't even remember what it was called. It was like environmental something. And one of the requirements was to, we had to go up like on the mountainside somewhere in the trees and we had to sit and write something. And um, man, I really, I wish, I, I wonder if somewhere in my boxes of stuff, I still have it. Uh, I think I probably do. It's probably all smudged with dirt. I remember sitting there <laughs> looking around. There's, there's a Northwest Washington. So there's ferns and moss everywhere. And um, I don't think I wrote anything very profound, but I, I do remember sitting there trying to like feel something right? I was kind of like an <laughs> emotional kid. Um, I wrote poet, horrible, horrible poetry. And um, I remember having this moment of uh, sitting in nature and having to just think and look around and observe. And um, I haven't done any nature writing since, but I have, I have plans uh, for the future. Maybe we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll get into this in a little bit. Oh, but, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. But I do think there's something, yeah. Um, about being outdoors that in some of us stirs something and some of us just use that to have a nice experience, but I'm glad that people like you then use it productive, productively, not just to be productive, but then to share and to give the rest of us something else to read and reflect on. Um, I think our conversation today will be a little bit odd in that this is a Western writing podcast. Um, but your book, Unnatural Selection, um, it weaves lots of stories about Western outdoor spaces that fit really well with the podcast, very appropriate for this, the themes that we deal with. But you then weave in some very intimate and not particularly Western or explicitly Western experiences from your life as an adoptee and your search for your biological parents. So I'm not exactly sure how to balance this. Um, I don't want to stray too far away from the West per se, but I do like this idea of thinking out loud together about ways in which quote unquote Western experiences um, inform or enmesh with other parts of our identities and our lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that should resonate with, 
with people. And even as maybe we veer into the, the story of your, your adoptions experiences, I think it might speak to people in unexpected ways. Um, uh, I mentioned before we started recording that I'm, I'm also an, uh, an adopted child. So I read your book, I think with a different lens than some may, um, but it's a topic that's particularly intimate, particularly fraught to kind of unveil publicly. So I'm curious, as you decided to write a memoir, you could have written a memoir about your wilderness experiences. And throughout this book, you give us these short teases about periods in your life that could probably fill volumes of <laughs> nature writing memoirs. Like you mentioned that you went to Alaska, but we find out almost nothing about what you experienced in Alaska, right? So I'm curious as you sat to write, sit, sit down to write a memoir, why did you choose to, instead of just writing like a kind of a nature wilderness memoir, why did you choose to take that and use it as a vehicle to tell this story of adoption and searching for your biological mother and father? I, I it's, it's easy to tell stories about like, you know, fantastic things that we did or fantastic things that happened to us, you know, when the bear walked into the campsite or when you, you know, when I fell out of the raft in the Grand Canyon. But um, to, in my mind, I couldn't, I couldn't really justify just writing that because there was no reflection. There was no takeaway. There was no like, so what does this really mean? Um, but what I did notice was that I, I did want to tell those stories. I knew something was important about them beyond just the pushing, you know, pushing my body and testing myself against the elements, you know, beyond those tropes. Um, and I knew that there was there was some reason I was wandering around out in the wilderness for 10 years. Uh, and I while I was doing it, I didn't know why, but it, you know, it did pretty much coincide with the, the search that I did. So there was, there was something about being outdoors and working outdoors and the search for my own identity that really played off of each other. Um, it was almost as if <clears throat> being in nature, being in the outdoors sort of, um, <sighs> held me in a way like it kind of gave me a landscape to well it literally gave me a landscape to within which to kind of figure out who I was what I wanted to do how you know do I really want to search for these people it's very scary what if they reject me you know all of that stuff it was sort of um like I created or I found another world in which to function while I figured all of that stuff out and that was that was in the outdoors um, and Grand Canyon in particular. Um, I, you know, was lucky enough to get a job there when I was 23 working as a ranger and there's nothing like living on the rim of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> um, and I, I had been there as a little kid, but it, I, it had never been a, you know, an important place for me until I went there to live as a young adult. And um, the, the Canyon really became a home for me in a way that um, I hadn't experienced before in in nature. Like I just felt like I belonged there, and it's a weird thing to feel like you belong to because it's a very giant, giant space, <laughs> um, and it's and it's so uh, you know otherworldly looking that it, it actually is really pretty alienating to to a lot of people. I mean, I think it's pretty typical for people to drive up to the rim of the canyon look out at its grandeur and beauty and go, this isn't real. You know, like it looks like it's beautiful. It looks like a postcard. Um, but I had the opportunity uh, to go down into the canyon a lot because I lived there and it became a very intimate space for me. And so it kind of, uh, which seems really ironic and sort of nonsensical in the sense that it's this, it's the desert, it's everything is sharp, everything is, is rock, everything is, is hot in the summer and cold in the winter. It, it doesn't seem like a warm, cozy space, but it really felt uh, like it could hold me and, and what I was sort of emotionally going through at the time. Um, and so 
to me, like the Western landscape is just paired forever <laughs> here, here, here forevermore um, with, uh, you know, how the, how I can go out and sort of find, uh, find my emotional center, I guess. It's interesting to think about some of these Western landscapes that are just dwarf our humanity or our sense of, you know, importance in the universe, right? Yeah, you stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon and uh, where do humans fit into that? It's not right. immediately clear. Um, as a child, you spent plenty of time outdoors, but going to the Grand Canyon in your early 20s was your first time uh, being away from family. So were you aware at the time that you were kind of looking for belonging or home or something to uh, attach to? Or is this something that you just come to, that you reflected on later as you sat down to write this book or, you know, in the other interceding years? Were, were you scrambling for belonging as you, uh, you know, did that rain, that year as a ranger? I think I, uh, subconsciously I knew that, but I definitely, it was not a conscious thing. I was not like, I'm going to go to the Grand Canyon and find, find a way to belong. You know, um, I just, I don't know, the early, the time in our life that is the early 20s is, is just a really chaotic time in, in lots of ways. And so I was definitely not very self-aware um, in, in a lot of ways. <laughs> so it definitely was retrospective, like, trying look back looking back on that period of my life and going what was that about and what was I doing and you know um I thought I just wanted adventure you know um but I really you know looking back on it I'm like oh I was just searching and searching and searching for myself you know like who am I where can I feel like I belong why don't I feel like I belong oh maybe it's because you're adopted and you don't have any information about your um you know, biological origins. So um, there was just a lot going on for me and that, and I was not very self-aware about it. And we should note to listeners, this isn't to say that you had, that you were coming from a horrible home life. Like you, it sounds like you had a loving adopted family where you felt absolutely. loved and felt yeah. like you absolutely belonged, but there was this kind of great unknown kind of floating out there Um that hinted at all kinds of possibilities, not just counterfactual, like what could have been possibilities, but questions about uh, about genetics and your biology and, right. um, you know, what was passed down to you genetically that, I mean, beyond, I mean, identities are as a complicated thing, right? Nature versus nurture and, and whatnot. But, um, but it's at this time in your life where also you do start having some health issues. Um, right. and questions about an, an undiagnosed, which later you learned was an autoimmune disorder, but this, and, and you were kind of grappling for, well, where does this come from? And right. faced with the fact that you, you have no idea that that's actually what drove me, you know, to start thinking about my biological parents and who they were as I got to the, you know, my mid thirties. And I think I went, um, I went snowboarding. And I hadn't been snowboarding for about a, maybe a decade or so. And um, I had a really great time. Um, but for the first time in my life, I had the realization that my body was getting a little bit older. And I had the sense that, oh, I can't just fly down the mountain with reckless abandon because my knees might give out. And I never felt like kind of the frailty of my body before. I was like, oh. And then it hit me, I was like, I wonder what I'm, what am I carrying in my genes? Do all males in my family die at age 36 and I only have a year to live, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's kind of just this, this unknown of what's, what is my body, but, or what's, what's in my body. Yeah. And that's, it's not something that um, people who are not touched by closed adoption really have <clears throat> much consciousness of. Um, and it is such a, you know, the great unknown, as you put it, it's such a, big deal. Um, and it's, it's often really downplayed 
um, in adoption life. And uh, for lots of adopted people, it, it is a really, really big deal. And, and both sort of psychically, but also um, physically. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, you know, nuts and bolts fact about, you know, your health. It's like, oh, you need to know this information and you don't have any access to it. And, and so what do you do about that? Yeah, I think many people just don't ever, you know, people who aren't adopted, they just never think about it. Um, I remember when I had my, our first child, um, and I'm holding my daughter, and I'd never, this thought had never crossed my mind before. But I'm holding her, and it hit me that for the first time in my life, I was, uh, this is someone who I was related to by blood. Right. I'd never experienced that before, but I also never even, it never even crossed my mind that I didn't have a blood relation that I knew. And it hit me. I was like, wow, like, well, it is a big deal. So it's kind of like you said before, like, yeah, I grew up in a loving family. I was not abused, (laughs) nothing like that. Um, And so, and, and adoption was really normalized. You know, they, my parents told me since I was, you know, since they got me that I was adopted. So it was never a surprise. Um, uh, and so it really, it really didn't occur to me either until I got sick and I'm like, Oh, am I a ticking time bomb? Like, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's a, it's a strange, um, it's a strange sort of double life, I guess that you can have a, you know, you can have a perfectly fine, childhood and wonderful family. And, and yet there's this other really powerful thing happening at the same time that, you know, certain things will make you realize like holding, you know, holding your baby and going, oh, this is the first time I've ever seen a blood relative of mine. Like that's a super powerful thing that hadn't been, you hadn't had access to before, you know, it just hit you like a wall. I imagine. I mean, I had the same experience when my son was born, just like, Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a biological extension of me. And that's something that just people don't think about or not that they take it for granted, but they definitely don't think about it. I'm curious that I sometimes, yeah, I spend a lot of time outdoors. It's my main hobby, you know, trail running or hiking and stuff. And I, uh, I just, I have to do it. It's a compelled to, you know, I just have to get out there and I, I get cranky if I go for too long without getting out on the trails. Um, and I, I don't understand people who don't have that, who <laughs> they, I mean, I live at the, you know, I live here on the, in the Wasatch mountains in Utah, the mountains just soar up from right behind our house. And I know lots of people who've never set foot on those trails. And I just, I don't get, it. I don't understand. Um, uh, similarly, I know um, adopted uh, people from closed adoptions who have just never had the itch to mm-hmm. explore or to find out. I don't, I don't know if I'm like straining to make a, a parallel here, but mm. um, do you think that subconsciously, you know, your desire to to get out and explore, you know, the Grand Canyon and other places you went, the search for belonging, do you think it was subconsciously informed by this kind of growing desire to find out more about yourself biologically? Is there a some kind of shared impulse there? I do think that those two things informed each other for sure. Um, I I think I think that my drive to be outdoors and to have adventure and to, you know, have the most outdoor focused job I could find um, was, was informed by this need I had to also, um, you know, find out who I was. So those two things were absolutely intertwined for me. And I don't know, you know, which informed the other the most, which influenced the other the most, but to me, they're absolutely paired in my mind, which is why, which is why I sat down to write about it, you know, because I'm like, well, this is a this is a pairing that you don't see too often in in literature or really or people talking about it. Really, it's like, you know, um, when I would, would tell people, oh yeah, I'm writing a book about adoption and wilderness, <laughs> and people would say, what's the you know, where's the common ground there? And um, 
I'm like, well, that's, you know, that's exactly what I'm trying to figure out is, is why those two things were so intertwined for me. Um, but, you know, thinking about it, there's a lot of very classic literature that, that kind of touches upon that sort of thing of, you know, people needing to wander the desert, for example, to, you know, find the true meaning of God or, and, and the whole thing of, you know, Moses in the basket, basket of rushes or, or whatever. Um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff about uh, children who are without their parents for some reason um, in, in literature. And there's a lot of, of stuff about, you know, going out into something that is wild and unknown in order to find something that is internal. So um, that's kind of, yeah, this classic paradox in literature, world religions, right? That the wilderness, right. the desert, the place where you're left just, you know, to yourself is where you, you know, truly maybe find yourself or find God or, or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But it's not just literature, um, and I don't I don't know if you're a religious person or not. But like, but there's something about being out there with no one else around that it it, it does something to humans. It's it sparks something mm-hmm. within us. Um, is this speak to why you chose to move from just being like you know a park ranger at the Grand Canyon answering? tourist questions, you know, to then um, seeking to become like, a, get training to become a wilderness guide to do stuff more off grid and out there? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to push my boundaries. I wanted to see what I was capable of doing, partly because I was, I had gotten sick and I had this disease and I didn't, I was very young and I didn't want to succumb to it. I wanted to like somehow you know, show it who was boss, I guess. Um, So part of it, that was me, um, you know, trying to overcome the, the, you know, fear I had of becoming um, really, really more sick, I guess. Um, So part of it was, you know, testing, testing that boundary. Um, And part of it was, um, I think, a sense of um, trying to prove my own worth <laughs> to walk the earth. I, I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it, I think it's pretty typical for, for some adoptees to feel like, you know, like to question your worth, to question your value, because you have been, quote unquote, given away, right? And that, you know, sets up a question of like, well, what's wrong with me? What, you know, why would somebody do that? Um, This is all, of course, subconscious. I mean, yeah, there's lots and lots of reasons why, why people place children for adoption that are, you know, totally legitimate. But, um, but it, it does have an impact on the psyche of the, of the child, right? Like, Hmm, maybe I am not worth keeping. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm not worth being here. So part of it for me, I think, was going out and, you know, like stomping on the earth to to let it know I was here and to, you know, kind of help prove to myself that I did um I did have I, I did was entitled to to be here, I guess, in some way or another. I mean, I don't I don't think I explained that very well, but well, I don't um, think I don't think you can explain it. It's um <laughs> Yeah, there's not really words for it. So you think that um, not just being a tourist guide, but like the way out there wilderness experience was subconsciously a way for you to carve out your individual place in this universe, um, just as yeah. you to prove like I exist just as myself. You existed uh, in a loving adopted family. Um, but before that, there's this reality that at one point um you didn't belong right um and and you don't know why um and so perhaps that drove you to try to prove that you you worth you're you are worth 
existing on your own terms and for nothing else. And what better place right. to do that than out in the middle of nowhere with just you and the elements. Right. Then there was also a, a, another element of it, which is that, um, so this was back in the late eighties, early nineties. And um, there weren't a lot of um, women out in the, out in the wilds alone at that point. Well, there, I think there was just kind of a, a trend just, just starting, you know? So if you, we look back, I've read a lot of, you know, we all have read wild, right? <laughs> um, and I, I know a lot of other women who are about my age, who are in their twenties, in the early nineties, um, heading out into nature by themselves. Um, and uh, it, that was pretty unusual at the time. It's less unusual now, thankfully, um, but it was also wanting to kind of strike into unknown territory into the, in that way for me as well. So it's like multiple things going on. It did take me a long time to figure it all out. <laughs> mm -hmm. What did your uh, family say when, you know, they're, they're 20 something and you had graduated from college at this point? This is all post bachelor's degree, but you right. said, Hey, I'm going right. to the Grand Canyon. And they're like, Oh, great. We know the great, we've been there. And then you say, I'm going to Alaska to wander <laughs> around with grizzly bears and stuff. What was their reaction to that? I mean, and um, specifically thinking about like kind of this gendered aspect of like their daughter, because right. you had brothers yeah. as well, but this is their, I had brothers too. their little girl yeah. going out. <laughs> well, they were, they were always really committed to, um, to being really gender egalitarian. Um, so they never, you know, batted an eye really when I wanted to do something like that. Uh, I'm sure they worried. <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm sure they would have worried if my brother had gone out into the Alaskan wilderness for 35 days, you know, but um, they, they wanted their kids to, you know, to have, the freedom to do things like that. And so they, they really didn't ever try to stop me at all. Um, but I think part of it, <clears throat> and I think I mentioned this in the book is, I think part of it was they didn't completely understand what some of the dangers were, you know, which is for the best really. But <laughs> you know, the dangers are grizzly bears, but I, I got in a car accident, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, like, that was the injury trying to come home from yeah. Alaska when you got hurt. Yeah. Right. I right. mean, you, and you also share this kind of terrifying moment as a child where, um, you know, a, a man pulled a knife on you and a friend and, um, you know, a, a real creeper it's yeah. sort of talking to you young girls about inappropriate things. And I mean, so there's danger. You don't have to go to Alaska to find danger. Right. right? Yes, it's, exactly. It's right in the backyard. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. I mean, that was three blocks from, my house. <laughs> you know? So exactly. I want to shift gears a little bit here and touch on the story you tell about um, hiking to some ancestral Puebloan uh, ruins in Arizona. Is it Keat Seal? Is that how it's pronounced? It is Keat Seal, yeah. Um, and you, I think you related that story because uh, your mother goes with in a way she takes she goes by horse and you meet her there but you're kind of on your own for the hike a lot of the hike but you have this moment where you talk about uh finding well the moki steps that you kind of want to climb up um the ruins but then also there's a skull there's uh human remains that are that you yeah. see in the canyon and you bring up this idea which then you relate to your search for your biological family which is um who has the like the ethics of who has the the right to disturb the past mm -hmm. and who has the right to go barge back into a biological parent's life and say here i am you gave me up 35 years ago for i don't know for what reason but i'm barging back into your life um is that something that you consciously wrestled with this question of should I go searching? Uh, is there damage or harm I could cause in this woman's life? Uh, does that weigh, did that weigh on you? 
Oh, absolutely. Yes. I, I, I would say that probably was what was the main thing that, that tripped me up and, and slowed down my progress or my search um, was, you know, thinking like, well, first of all, what if she doesn't want to be found? <laughs> you know? uh, how will that, that would be just terrible, terrible for me, but also, yeah, I don't want to mess up anybody else's life. You know, I, I don't know the circumstances um, surrounding her decision to, to place me for adoption. So who knows? It could be anything. It could be something that it's not a good idea to, to unbury the past, you know, it's, so it really did weigh on me a lot. And I think, I think it does for, you know, any adopted person who's consider, considering a search. Um, and I think also adopt, I mean, uh, birth parents have that same fear, you know, they, they're like, oh, I don't want to mess up that, you know, my child's life. And, you know, I don't want to disturb anything. And um, it's a, it is a big ethical question with no answer, really, <laughs> you know, no one answer. Um, and that, yeah, seeing that skull <laughs> and we had this little, you know, debate about the, the guy who had found the skull was a ranger and he wasn't sure he wanted to report it because he was afraid that the um, archaeology department would uh, disinter it. And um, he thought it should stay where it was, you know, and then the other argument there is that it well, then it's, you know, somebody else might find it and take it, which would be awful. Or, you know, it might erode out and get stepped on by a cow or, or whatever and just be destroyed. And, you know, like all of the angles of that, I did, I do feel like kind of um, mirrored all of the angles of what, what if that I considered as I was, um, you know, thinking about searching and deciding whether I should, um, you know, who does have the right to disturb the past? super interesting question to me. Yeah. And it seems like you approached it with great care and um, kind of deference to the, the potential, um, you know, disruption that it may, may have been causing in, in their lives when you did locate them. Um, you had two uh, op or uh, many options for how to find them. You could just try to do all the research on your own. Um, and with closed adoption records, that can be very challenging. Some of them have lots of information. Some of them have none. Some adoption agencies might be really tight-lipped and others might give you little hints. Um, in Colorado, you had the option to go through what was called the Confidential Intermediary Program, where a third party goes and does the research, contacts them and asks, are you open to contact or not? Um, and you you have that on the table and then you related an experience you had rafting in the Grand Canyon uh, and you know almost drowning and someone <laughs> yelling um, participate in your own rescue um, and and for a while you decide to go it alone and try to do the research around talk maybe tell us about the, this you know Grand Canyon story but then uh, how does this then relate to your efforts to you know, as they said, like participate in your own rescue or save yourself, or in this case, kind of find yourself. Right. Um, so you want to hear about the Grand Canyon story? Is that what yeah, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us, give us the the quick the the, the quick version. The quick there. and dirty. <laughs> so. Um, so this is post there's... Grand Canyon, then post Alaska, and then you had gone to New Mexico and gotten hired. Uh, uh, by a school as a guide right yeah yeah and now you're down later than in the grand canyon rafting right so i was with a group of friends and i was just going to do the lower half of the canyon so that means that so the the grand canyon is about 270 something miles from from dam to dam basically um and so I was just going to do the, the lower part, which meant that I had to hike in halfway through the trip and meet them down at the river. Um, but <clears throat> the, the upper half is still has big water, but it's relatively calm compared to the lower half. So the tricky part about doing just the lower half is that you get on the water and you're suddenly in some of the biggest water in the country 
maybe in the world, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> um, with very little preparation. You didn't have and, the three or four um, days prior, like exactly, gliding along, right. learning how to paddle or, yeah. Right, right. So, um, so within an hour, maybe we were in a really big rapid and um, our boat flipped. And so I swam it. <laughs> and uh, it, that particular rapid is is known as a, a wave train. This, you know, there's lots of ways that rapids can be rapids. You know, like they can be very rocky, or they can have holes, or all kinds of different things. But this one is known as being a, a wave train, which is, you know, imagine the back of the Loch Ness monster. You know, just like up and down and up and down and up and down. And there's probably like seven or eight of these giant swells and dips and so our boat flipped in the first one and so i went up and down all of the rest of them and um it's it's just huge water so it was really really terrifying um because i had to you know i got plunged into the water in the troughs of each wave um and you know came up just barely in what felt at least like barely in time to to catch a breath and then go over the top of the next one and down into the following one. Um, so it was a, you know, it was a real baptism. <laughs> um, <laughs> that very first day, first hour of that trip, of a, of a week long trip. Um, and so, yeah. And so then when I swam out of the, out of the current, there's somebody is yelling, participate in your own rescue. And I'm just, I was just so dazed. I was free. The water in Grand Canyon is freezing cold, really, really cold. I'm, you know, I'm a little hypothermic. I'm in shock kind of, I'm freaked out. And um, somebody is yelling, participate in your own rescue. I couldn't even make sense of what that meant. You know, um, it was all I could do to like pull myself out of the water and sit on a rock um, and try to figure out which way was up. So you know, metaphorically, uh, that memory or that event really spoke to me in terms of, uh, you know, what do you do when you need something and you don't know how to do it? Um, and you, you, do you have to do it? You, do you have to do the work yourself? Um, do you have to rescue yourself or can, you know, is there some other way to, to get the help that you need? And, um, and yes, as you said, I decided to try to just go and do it myself <laughs> to, to do the searching, um, which felt very weird to me because it, you know, it, it's, I guess it's, it's not exactly illegal, but it's sneaky. <laughs> and I don't like being sneaky. <laughs> That's not my nature. And so um, it was a, you know, to me, those two events felt very similar in terms of their magnitude, like being so, you know, like being so sneaky as to go, you know, you know, sneak around in archives and you know, libraries and talking to various, you know, organization, people and organizations, like trying to find somebody whose name I don't know, uh, as, you know, as compared to being yelled at to participate in my own rescue when I had just almost felt like I had just almost drowned. Like to me, those things are very paired. It's very weird. So, yeah, because one person at one of the agencies suggests or at an, uh, an organization for adoptees trying to find their families suggested, well, because you had heard that they were, your mother was, had Norwegian ancestry, so she probably had a Norwegian name. And they said, "Well, why don't you um, call the Sons of Norway, this uh, organization in Col Colorado, where you knew that you had been born, and basically lie and say, well, I'm, I want to get a big family reunion together.' And I know there's this one family. I just can't remember the last name. It was 1960 <laughs> something, and to try to maybe get them to cough up some names that maybe then you can then go chase down. But that didn't feel you didn't do that. Anyway. I didn't do that. That was more than I could muster. Yeah, that just, yeah, I, I just couldn't be that disingenuous. Um, and, you know, as a result, I didn't get that far <laughs> with, with my own search, um, going the sneaky route and uh, ended up having to, you know, eventually do the confidential intermediary. 
program, which which worked very quickly. Um, but I part of part of why it took so long to do it. There's two reasons. One was it seemed to me that if a stranger were to call up a birth parent, my birth parent, and say like, "Hey, Andrea's trying to find you. Do you want to be found?" It would be very easy to say no. <laughs> and you and you didn't want that. You desperately didn't want that. I to did be not the want response. to be rejected. No, yeah, and um, you know, because there's zero emotional connection there. You, you're, there's not a voice. There's not a face. There's it's very easy to say, "Oh no, no thanks." So I couldn't face that idea. Uh, and then the other thing was that, um, and if if that were the case, if the if whoever they found were to uh, say no, all of the, any information that they had found would be resealed. And I would need, I would have no information at all. It would be completely just put away. I would have nothing. And that seems so almost that worse really, because someone yes. had found them. Right. Someone succeeded in finding them. They could <laughs> yes. be found. And then it's all locked back up. That's right. Yeah. I could, I just couldn't deal with that. And it's my information, you know, like it's, it's my it's my origin. It's my information. And that just made me really angry. Um, and I had to pay $500 to do it <laughs> for, to get my information. And so all of that together just uh, was, was too much for me to swallow for a long time. And then finally, uh, it became important enough for me to, to find them that I just was like, okay, whatever, whatever it takes. And then it happened very quickly. So yeah, it, took it was week, all a process. Said. Yeah, a week, literally a week. Yeah. And then I felt kind of foolish. But um, however, I do think that I needed all of that time to do a lot of processing. Um, I was definitely not the same person by the time that I did find them um, than I was when I started thinking about it. And I was much more grown up and mature and, you know, uh, had had figured out a bunch of the stuff I needed to figure out. So I think it was all for the, all for the good, but there were some, uh, some angsty years in there. Yeah. <laughs> in between. And those years you go to grad school, you get married, um, you have a, a child, um, a lot, mm -hmm. a lot happens. Um, yeah. A lot of those important life milestones. Yeah. So, and, yeah. you know, just, just, you know, spoil the, ending um although i don't think anyone reads books like this to like have surprise endings but like it it all turns out like as as wonderfully as you probably could have hoped for uh like actually remarkably well um, <laughs> um i'm curious if so you, you kind of write about this decade of you in the wilderness and in nature and this kind of parallel and at the same time these parallel efforts to find your family and how during those years that the wilderness and these outdoor experiences kind of provided you your, they were there was your family like the environment was your family these little side canyons in the grand canyon that you talk about getting to know their personalities and uh that became your your world and where you belonged um if you had found them and it hadn't turned out well, how do you think you would look back differently on that decade of being a mm -hmm. wilderness guide? And how did, how would it color your um, relation? Cause you, you pitch the wilderness as kind of this interlude that became your family and then delivered you uh, into, you know, you you have your adoptive family then your family kind of world and belonging grows as you add the wilderness and the environment and you have this enlarged family. And then it delivers you to an even larger one where you now have integrated in these multiple biological uh, family worlds. Um, if that last stage hadn't gone well, do you think your relationship today would be different with, with wilderness and the outdoors? Or would you look back at that kind of middle period of your life differently? That's a really good question. Um, I, I hadn't thought to ask myself that before. Um, 
Well, I think that uh, probably I would look at it as um, that decade as, um, you know, kind of in the same way in, in the sense that um, it, it provided something I needed at the time. And, um, you know, by the, as you mentioned, by the time that I did find my bio family, you know, I was married, I, I you know, I had created family in a couple other ways too. Um, I had my own little family. Um, I had all these wilderness skills and all the, this experience in the outdoors that I could draw upon for for strength and solace and, and stuff like that. So I think that, um, I don't think I would look on it with a, you know, with shade. I think <laughs> I think it would still be, be this really important and useful period or, or you know, uh, tool that I used in my life to Do you think you'd be using me. it more today? Do you think you'd be more outdoorsy today than you are? Well, that's hard to say too, because I do, I am pretty outdoorsy still. I mean, it's still my favorite thing to do is to go backpacking or, um, but I am like, you know, a, a university professor. So like, I have to spend a certain amount of time sitting in front of a computer and, you know, in classrooms and stuff, um, hopefully <laughs> in the future, um, if we ever get to go back to school. Um, but uh, so I, I don't, I don't know. I think uh, it, it really set me up as a, a certain kind of person who, you know, it's, it's my go-to for, like you said, for trail running and, and hiking, like that's what you do. And so that decade in which I spent a lot of time outdoors, I think um, cemented for me that, that this is my touchstone, you know? So if I hadn't, or if, if things hadn't turned out as well, yeah, maybe I would have been driven to, um, you know, to test myself against the elements more as a way of um, sort of mitigating some of that, some of the pain that that would have caused. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, maybe not because I, I, I did already have like my little family that I started with my husband and my son. And so it's, it's hard to say. <laughs> Yeah. But, Sorry. It's kind of a count. Yeah. A counterfactual question. <laughs> it's impossible to answer that, but, um, I was taken somewhat by surprise in that for most of the way you tell the story, it was really you thinking about your biological mother and, you know, do I look like her? Um, you know, what did I, you know, what, what did I inherit? What kind of personality traits and things did I inherit from her? And you met her and she's a wonderful, warm, loving woman, right? And then at some time, uh, but, but you were surprised like, oh, I'd actually, I don't look like her that much. And your, your half siblings, there wasn't kind of, you didn't see yourself in them like you thought. Right. Um, and then <clears throat> sometime later that you uh, do eventually meet your biological father, um, who your biological mother did not end up marrying and they hadn't been in contact. And it turns out he didn't know that she had actually ended up having you. Um, and I was surprised that you unexpectedly kind of found yourself in him. Like uh, you look more like him. You have uh, lots of shared outdoorsy interests. Um, did this surprise you at the time? Because you expected to find it all in your, in your mother not in this man yeah. who, had, who had left your mother. Um, right. But you ended up uh, finding a lot of yourself in him. How do you reflect on that? Yeah, it was, that was ironic. <laughs> um, yeah, it, well, especially because the the little bit of information that I did have about my origins was from her point of view, because she was the one who, uh, you know, worked with the adoption agency. So, um, all of the information that she gave to the adoption agency was, you know, filtered through her lens. So there was less information about my birth dad. Um, and so I had less information about my birth dad. And also, you know, <clears throat> being female, I identified with her more. 
So she was my main focus for a super long time. Um, and and uh, yeah, and it was really kind of surprising for me to, to find that we were not, you know, we didn't look alike and, you know, it was that we were pretty different. Um, I guess I didn't really expect then because of that to, to find more similarity with my birth dad. Um, Cause I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess that, that question is not gonna get answered by this search for, you know, for biological parents. Um, so that when I did meet him and, um, you know, he's like, he has lived on the front range his whole life and loves wide open spaces and shares my love of like, you know, that particular landscape of wide open spaces and desert and, you know, stuff like that. <clears throat> I really wasn't expecting that, you know, I was expecting more of the same of just like not really you know, getting questions answered in terms of why I am who I, who I am or the way I am. Um, and so it was, it was kind of a nice surprise. Um, and, but very ironic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unexpected. Um, there's a lot of touching moments in your story. Um, uh, I got a little misty, uh, you know, you, you included the text of the letter that was delivered to your biological mother, kind of saying, you know, are, here's who I am, here's why I'm doing this, are you open to contact? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the feelings as you wrote that letter, the feelings when you got that le a letter back, um, uh, when you first talked to her, met her, and then the same, you know, for your dad, um, I think about in my life, um, you know, there's all kinds of things in my life that have, that I've had really emotional experiences, experiences with, but for me, you know, some of my strongest, you know, you know, what I might call like spiritual experiences have been alone in the wilderness outside. And it, it sounds like, you know, that you've wilderness provided a lot for you emotionally for a long time as well. Um, I'm curious how these how you compare these, you know, the, the fulfillment, the emotion, the sense of belonging that the environment, you know, the outdoors provides you, kind of compared with now this enlarged sense of belonging and emotion from an adoptive and biological family. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know really exactly what I'm asking, um, but you know, you know, how do you comp compare these? And I'm not asking you to rank, like, what was the most intimate, emotional, or spiritual experience or moment I had? But, you know, how do these all fit together in kind of informing then, who, you know, who you are as a person or reviewing your life? Like, what has brought you joy and fulfillment? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that what immediately what I thought of when you were speaking was the sort of um, the feeling that I get that I think most people get <laughs> when we have the opportunity to go outside at night and and quietly look at the stars if we're lucky enough to live in a place where we can see the stars um and you are lucky enough to have a few moments to really just you know lie on the ground and look up at the sky um there's that sense that that comes upon us of you know, first, like, wow, look at all those stars, how far away they are, how infinitesimally small I am. You know, it, it's this strange, like, game of perspective, like, wow, I'm a tiny, 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 tiny speck in this giant universe. And then at the same time, like, feeling utterly connected to all of it. So first feeling kind of isolated by it, and then feeling connected to all of it. Like to me, that's a, a metaphor that really rings true for how that my search and reunion process was, which was, you know, at the same time feeling infinitesimally small and alienated, but also connected to something big and beyond. And um, so I guess that would be my answer. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I think that's pretty universal, like for, you know, everybody who goes out and looks at the stars has that strange feeling of telescoping back and forth between feeling teensy 
and feeling like part of something very great, very giant and very wondrous. Um, and, you know, that was the, the kind of conclusion that I came to in writing the book was that we have these very segmented or siloed or compartmentalized ideas about what is family in this, in our culture, at least. Um, and I was definitely, um, you know, persuaded by that, by that, by our culture's view of what is family and what is not family. And what I eventually came to understand was that we're all so connected and to, to take out some of those compartments and to view it all as a one great wondrous whole um, and to allow, you know, so many more people into my view of who is my family um, was incredibly fulfilling and just so offered so much solace. Um, and it, all of that was constructed by my own brain. You know, all of that, all of the separation was constructed um, and it took a long time to pick that apart and get the feeling of like, oh, it, this expanded idea of family. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, you, you joked that, you told people you're writing a book about wilderness and adoption. They're like, what? Like, how does that, how does that fit together? Right. Um, but there is a lot of really fascinating overlap about the idea, you know, of literally wandering in the wilderness, searching, ex exploring, seeing what you can find, what's around that next corner and not knowing and the anticipation and excitement of finding what's around that next corner um, with, you know, you know, in your case, searching uh, for a biological family. For other people's cases, you know, we're all on our own in our own metaphorical wilderness, searching for belonging and identity. And um, you know, in this way, maybe you know, kind of as you said, you know, looking up at the stars. Maybe this is why wilderness and the outdoors is um, such a powerful metaphor that can really be paired with maybe almost anything that we're working with in life, because it does have some kind of broad universal, just big picture, but yet very intimate connections that, that we can kind of bounce maybe anything off of and find resonance. Right. You know, unexpected right. Yeah. Things. And also find perspective. Yeah. yeah. Because when you, you know, when you look at the big picture, it, it puts, you know, your small picture in, into better perspective, like, oh, okay, this, this isn't so hard or so important or so over, you know, overwhelming. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think so. And it's also really primal for us. I mean, you know, humans have lived out in the, the landscape for many tens of thousands of years. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of stuff I think built into our, you know, collective consciousness about how primal and important that grounding in in nature is. And you know, I mean, a lot of us had gotten pretty far away from it because of where we live and you know the kinds of jobs that we have. But um, if we have the opportunity to go back outside, I think that does tug at most people still. Yeah. Well, maybe we're, they don't know it. Yeah. Um, well, maybe your book will awaken them to it, perhaps. Um, That's what I'm hoping. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, we're we're. I think our time is is mostly up. Um, I wanted to thank you for you know sharing this deeply uh, intimate, personal. I mean, it's really vulnerable, you know, what you've shared, um, but it's touching and. You know, again, as I we wrap up three years of this podcast and me trying to mostly just I want to talk with interesting people who've written interesting things, but um, so it's very self-serving for me. But I'm also <laughs> hoping, you know, the, one of the taglines is I've been hoping to spark curiosity in people and to make people think, just to make them think about where they live, uh, be it the land or the people around them or societies, cultures, histories, whatever it is, but to, to pause and stop and think about who am I? Where do I live? Especially if you're here in the West, you know, what does it mean for me to be in this region? And I, your, your book does that really powerfully. It causes, causes me to stop and think a lot. So thank you for, thank you for the work. It was, and I'm really glad that you, you know, that you shared it with us. Oh, thank you. It's so, so wonderful to talk 
uh, with somebody who's read it so closely and and also you know with your adoption background who really has who gets some of that stuff in a way that that the average reader might not but um yeah you made me think about a lot of things that uh that you know i i had thought about while writing the book but haven't come back to recently so it was fun to to think about them again Thanks so much for this opportunity. Yeah, and con- yeah, congrats on the book, and we look forward to seeing what else you uh, you send our way in the future. All right, excellent. <laughs> All right, take care, Andrea. Thanks. Well, that's it for this month. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll subscribe. Please leave us a review on whatever app or platform you're listening through, or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates, leave comments, and communicate with me. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Rudd Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. We are an interdisciplinary research center that supports academic research and the promotion of public understanding of the North American West. We host regular public lectures, which we live stream. We have an annual funding cycle with awards, grants, fellowships in categories that nearly anyone researching and working on the region from nearly any disciplinary approach or towards nearly any kind of final product can apply. Learn more at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D center.byu.edu. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Anderson. That's Anderson with an O, dot com. I'll put a link in the episode description. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, just about everything else, so you can direct praise or critique my way. I'm the author and editor of a number of books uh, and other studies on the West, Borderlands, Native Peoples, Genocide Studies, Religion, and the Environment. To contact me about the podcast, my own research, or just about anything else, head to bwrensink.org. That's B-W-R-E-N-S-I-N-K dot org. Or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. Until next month, be well, be curious, and be kind.